please welcome our guest, Kobe Bryant. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> man, if I knew college was going to be like this, I would have took my butt to school. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for uh, coming to USC. Uh, checking it out for maybe your three daughters who are on their way here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. One for sure. One for sure. My other one's like, she's obsessed about going to UConn, so we'll, we'll have to try to figure that out. She's, she's obsessed with UConn. By the time she's old enough, USC women's basketball will be where UConn is now. All right. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> that's what I'm talking. That, that'll make my wife extremely happy to keep both of her babies home. So. Speaking of that last, uh, over the weekend, Arike uh, Agunbowali, when she hit the winning uh, shot both in the final and the semifinal, yelled Mamba mental mentality. <laughs> was, that, was that easy for you to listen to? Well, I mean, I, you know, I, I love watching great players do phenomenal things, you know, and it's always, uh, you know, it always makes you feel good that what I've done throughout my career has inspired the next generation, you know. Um, but, you know, my daughter just looked at me after the game. She goes, you know, we probably should have stayed home. Because <laughs> we were at the game. We went to the game to see UConn. And, you know, after she says that, she's like, man, we should have just stayed home. <laughs> yeah. Great performance. It was such a clutch shot, both of them. Yeah. Um, today, as I, as I mentioned, we want to focus on, like, three things primarily. Um, when we talk about mindset and mentality, uh, we certainly want to talk about your competitive philosophy. We want to talk about leadership and then some of the lessons through basketball. Uh, we're on a strict time schedule. We're going to get you out of here by 1.30. Uh, some students will ask questions at the end, but let's, do you mind if we dive right in? Sure, sure. All right. Let's go. So you, let's start with Dear Basketball, which began as a poem, you know, almost a, a love letter to basketball. Can you tell us the origin of that, uh, of that writing and how it went from a written poem to a movie? Well, I mean, it was um, just thinking about you know, how, was going, how was I going to announce that I was going to walk away from the game. And for the most part, you know, as athletes, we tend to think about that in terms of communicating that to the public or to fans. And, um, but I realized I hadn't really had a chance to speak to the game itself. And, um, and so I decided that was going to be my focus. And once I had that focus, the words came pretty quickly. I actually wrote two drafts um, within about 30 minutes. And the first one was more confrontational in nature because it felt like, it felt like the game was trying to tell me you need me. You, know, you can't you can't walk away from this you know this is who you are and so the first tone was more confrontational it was like no I can I can walk away from you I can do something without you you know and then like in every argument you kind of calm down and you start seeing all the beautiful things that you've learned from the game which is the second draft that you know you guys hear now um, but I wanted to make sure it was visual so it's easy to say you know, tell the game I love you so much um, but instead, I wanted to paint a picture with that. So if a kid is rolling his dad's stinky tube socks up, chances are you love the game enough to do that, you know? So it's trying to say things visually. And, uh, and fortunate enough, Glenn Keane was, uh, believed in a vision, and John Williams believed in a vision, and uh, we turned it into a, an animated film. <laughs> and give us a little bit of what's it like to be nominated and to win an Academy Award. You know, you talk about being a kid and rolling up and playing uh, basketball your whole life. When you were a kid, did you ever dream of hearing and the Oscar goes to? No, I, 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 no. I mean, I grew up in Italy, okay? So like, I didn't even know Oscars was a thing. Like, I, I didn't even, I had no idea, you know? And so um, when um, the nominations came out, we were nominated, it was like, oh, that's, that's pretty, it's pretty crazy. It's pretty insane. And then to actually win it, I remember winning and just looking at my wife and going, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like, what? Okay, all right, this happened. All right, all right. And I remember after we won it, we got in the car, and, you know, it was like a late night, right? So we out hanging out and stuff, and it's like four in the morning, and, you know, we're in the car going back, and I look at my wife and I go, 
now we got to follow this shit up. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're going to talk about Granity Studios and, and what projects you have coming, but you're right. You've set a pretty high yeah, bar. Yeah, just a little bit. Man, I don't know what the hell. You do what with Glenn Keane and John Williams. It's all downhill after that. It's like, you know, it's... Uh, but no, it's, it's been a fantastic experience. It's been wonderful. Um, but even more important than that, it was... I got a lot of funny looks my last year when people said, okay, what are you going to do when you retire? And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to be a storyteller. <laughs> okay, that's cute. <laughs> what is that? I said, well, you know, I tell stories. Okay, all right. But so when you retire, you're going to go through different stages. You're going to be depressed the first week, <laughs> the second week. And they would tell me this all the time. And so I felt like the nomination was, this, was, a, was, a, um, was validation that this thing is real, and I can do this. I do have talent other than you know, dribbling and shooting the basketball. I can actually write. Yeah, and so um, I think that was the most important thing. That is a great lesson. No matter what you do, there's other talents that you haven't nurtured yet that, that are sort of waiting there for you. Um, let's talk about your know, focus on basketball, since that was the predominant part of your life. When did you start playing basketball, and at what age did it become your primary focus? Um, you know, I was, I think I was born to play, man. I started playing at like two years old. And my father wasn't one of these fathers that was like, you're going to play basketball, or, you know. He wasn't one of those guys. It was just kind of, I was just around the game a lot, and uh, I gravitated to the ball, and I was completely geeking out about, like, the smell of the ball and, like, the way it sounds when it hits concrete versus how it hits a parquet floor and, like, the sound of the nets and the different material of the nets and, you know, there's certain basketball hoops, like in high school gyms and in college gyms, the rim sits slightly above the, the lower part of the backboard. And it was like, I was geeking out if I got into a gym which was like the NBA with the lower stanchion of the backboard and the, um, and the hoop were completely parallel with each other. Like, I, like little shit like that would freak me out. Like I, so to answer your question, I was born to do this thing, man. And, and I did it um, nonstop, all day long, um, from the age of two to when I retired, man. And it's interesting from the, uh, you know, from the movie and from what you say, it, it is as though, you know, when you fall in love with something, truly fall in love with it, you don't really have a choice. It chooses you. Right. And then you sort of become, you know, indebted to that. So it's interesting to see it come out as a love letter because mm -hmm. no one probably would assume that that would be the way you would express it. Sure. Well, no, I mean, it's, it's you know, that's the trick, isn't it? It's, it's finding what you love to do. I mean, we talk about hard work all the time. It's like, you know, man, if you got to get up every single morning and remind yourself how hard you need to work, you probably need to choose a different profession, you know? Because that shouldn't be there. I, I wake up in the morning excited to get to it, you know? If I'm not training, I'm missing it. If I'm not watching a game of basketball, I miss it. I, you know, there's no place I'd rather be. And if you have that feeling, then you're truly doing what... God has put you on this earth to do. Great advice. And then you, you, you left, uh, you went from high school. You didn't leave high school. You graduated from high school. You went directly to the NBA. You were so young, you were 17, that your parents had to sign your first NBA contract. Yeah. So <laughs> right. you're, you're the youngest person, not only on the team, but in the league. We've got a, a bunch of graduating students who are probably going to their first full-time job. Do you have any advice for students entering an organization and being the youngest person, not in the room, but in the whole company? Well, I mean, in, in business, it's a little different. Um, you know, it's, it's, I think the best way to prove your, your value is to work, is to learn, is to absorb, um, to be a sponge. Right? But you always want to outwork your potential. You know, as hard as you believe you can work, you can work harder than that. And that's what I tried to do when I first came in the league. But, you know, basketball is such a direct competition sport that me coming in at 17, I hated when, like, my teammates would say, you know, I get hit with an elbow, right? Shaq would hit me with an elbow in practice. And, like, you know, <laughs> you know Nick Van Exel would come up and say, are you okay? I'm like, motherfucker, what? <laughs> hey, Mao, are you okay? <laughs> what the hell's wrong with you? You know, so, like, I always had that extra chip on my shoulder. So, like, every day in practice for me was – really trying to annihilate everybody that, was, that I was playing against. Because I wanted to prove, you don't need to babysit me. Like, I, I'm fine, <laughs> you know? And, uh, and so it's always um, you know, that competitive nature, the work ethic, and curiosity. Because I asked a lot of questions. You know, playing with Byron Scott, I asked him a lot of questions. Eddie Jones, who was great at chasing guards off the screens, and I didn't understand how to do that. 
I would sit with him before practice, after practice. Um, Magic, um, James Worthy, Kurt Rambis, Kareem Abdul, all the Laker greats, I would always sit down and just ask him questions about certain games that I studied growing up. What actually happened there? What did you feel there? Why? You know, Bird tough to defend? Why? Because you look slow as shit to me. So he's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm, like, I'm missing something. So like, tell me what I'm missing. You know what I mean? And so I would always ask questions and try to learn as much as I could. <laughs> right? Uh, no? Oh, it's uh, a different generation. You guys probably never so even good. seen Larry Bird play, which yeah. is... Just How many that- have seen Larry Bird play? Hey, everybody's seen Larry Bird play. Right. That's, that's not a high enough percentage. We got uh, we got some work to do. They, they, they are, you know, they are 18 to 22, yeah, know, that's, so that's, it's yeah. before their time. But I just yeah. thought that could be the greatest meme to send to Boston this afternoon. Yeah. Well, my kids have never seen Jordan play, so yeah, that's crazy. they don't know. It's, it's that's like, crazy. They don't know. It's weird. Let's, let's dive into your, your mindset because I really think that you have so many things that translate beyond sports. Um, when we talk about mindset and beliefs, we talk about limiting beliefs as sort of being the ceiling of your potential. Um, you know, how you think about yourself, whether positively or negatively, that's probably what your potential is. How do you stretch your beliefs and make sure you are continually, continually pushing the boundaries of your comfort zone and your capabilities? I just dream. I dream. I have dreams and, you know, Dreams is uh, they should be pure. I, I think a lot of times, you know, when we're born into this world, we actually wind up going backwards. And it seems like the more we mature, uh, the more responsible our dreams become, and the more governors we put on ourselves and our ability to dream and to reimagine. And it's always a fight for us parents and you know, and for you guys to make sure that your dreams always stay pure. And so it's not a matter of of um, of pushing beyond your limitations or expectations. It's really a matter of protecting your dreams, protecting your imagination. That's really the key. And when you do that, then the world just seems limitless. And when you, when you set your dreams, a lot of times, especially in business and entrepreneurship, you, you have a big vision, and people will instantly start asking you how you'll do it. And so what we tell people is like, you know, don't get caught up with the how, because if you know every step to accomplish your dream, you haven't really dreamed big enough. Yeah. You shouldn't know every step of the way. And you'll, you're, you'll have a tendency to walk it back. And so I would say, yeah, be unrealistic in your dreams as well. well let's talk about one game in particular. We're not going to cover basketball highlights because we'd be here for months. Uh, <laughs> but let's talk about one game and how that sort of shatters the notion of what some people might think is possible. In 2006 against the Toronto Raptors, you scored 81 points, which is second only to Wilt Chamberlain's 100 points. No one has really come close to your total since. Uh, people have been in the 60s, including you. Um, you went 28 of 46 shooting, 18, to 20, 18 of 20 free throws. Uh, you scored 55 in the second half and 28 of your team's final 31 points. There, there's the scorebook above us that shows the, the scorebook. And the answer to the trivia question, who was the second leading scorer of that game is? I have no Smush idea. Parker. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. So, what do you have? Four? He had, yeah. He had 13. He had 13. But it, it was something that if you w- were watching it, it just kept building. Uh, now you know why I had to score 81. <laughs> right? Tough days, man. That was tough. If you, if you do look up at that lineup, you do understand it. See, that's, you know, I'm not even going to. But at, at the time, at the time, uh, the owner of the Lakers, Jerry Buss, said it was like watching a miracle happen. And for those of us who watched it on TV or were there, it really was one of those things you just couldn't believe was possible. Did you, you know, during the game, did you have to sort of like reset your beliefs? I know Lamar Odom was saying you can't get 60, right. you can't get 70. Or did you just let it flow and whatever happened, happened? Or were you really like gunning for numbers? No, I, you know, I always dreamed as a kid that, you know, it was possible to score 80 or 90 or 100. I always just like, you know, had a dream. You know, like sometimes you lay down in bed and you visualize things and you just kind of, you know, just, you know, that's how, that's at least how I would go to sleep. I'd lay down and I'd imagine playing for the Lakers and I'd imagine what the uniforms look like. I'd imagine where we'd be playing and, you know, the smell of the arena and all sort of stuff. And I would see myself, you know, getting hot 
you know, and, you know, score 10 straight points. And then, but in a dream, like, why would you ever interrupt that? Like, you're not going to have a dream and be like, okay, and then he misses his next six. Like, it's not going to happen. So you just keep dreaming and dreaming and dreaming. And before I go to sleep, I'm like at 120 points, you know? <laughs> and so, and so when you grow up, downloading that into your brain over and over and over. And then, you know, that summer, I made a thousand shots a day, a thousand, right? That's on top of weight training and my conditioning. I made a thousand shots and it weren't just shots. It were shots that you saw in that game. There were specific shots. I mean, it was coming out of the corner, going to the pinch post, footwork in the post, coming off the screen. It was very specific. So when you download that into your system and you go out in the, on the, in the court and you're just executing things that you've done thousands of times before and you have that dream, then that becomes possible. Yeah, everything's been, not choreographed, but it's been practiced so many times that it's, it's second just, nature. There, there's, there's, why reinvent it? Like, I, I don't understand that. You go out and play the game and you're just trying to create something new. No, no, this is what I do. This is what I do extremely well. You're going to have to stop me from doing that. And if you do stop me from doing that, I have a counter to that. Done. <laughs> you know, years later, you, uh, you watched a replay of that game and you live tweeted what you were thinking. And I thought that the, the students would like to see some of your tweets from watching like that game. I like to see it I don't remember what the hell so I said. So this is awesome. <laughs> so it says, watching the game now, I missed easy shots. I could have had 100. Down 14, I'm heating up. At this point, I wouldn't pass a kidney stone. And then lastly... Damn, I should have been a comedian, man. What the hell? And then lastly, I knew I should have got a fresh haircut for this game. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but missing two free throws is kind of ridiculous, though. <laughs> like, you make all those shots and you miss two free throws, you know, it's just kind of silly. It happens. Silly. It happens. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about mindset and philosophy, because we tell students that it's very important that you have a personal philosophy. In your basketball career, did you have an articulated competitive philosophy, something short that meant something to you that really stood for what you, what you played? Um, my philosophy was a very simple one. I... Um, and this is where I think film plays a big part of my life. I, I, you know, Rudy was one of my favorite films growing up. Right? And if, you, if you guys haven't seen Rudy, I suggest you go, you, you watch Rudy. The reason why it's a tepid, it's Notre it's Dame. It's, it's Notre Dame, it's, so it's, we don't get crazy guys, about you, that. You know, you, 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 I think the USC football program has done okay over the years. <laughs> so, you know, it's, um, but after watching that film, I come to understand if I could work that hard, every day um, with the, being blessed with the physical tools that I have, um, what would my career be? And I made a promise to myself from that day that I was gonna work that hard every single day so that when I do retire, I have no regrets. And that was the most important thing for me is to leave no stone unturned, get better every single day. And if I live that way, then over time, you know, I'd have something that was beautiful. But that was my philosophy. It seems like a pretty simple one, but, you know, if you live your life to just get better every single day, and you do that for 20 years, I mean, what do you have? That's exactly right. Did you, um, you know, you seemed at peace both before and during the game. Pre-game, I, I, you know, we watched you. During the anthem, you seemed to go to a place. Um, you know, were you generating calm, focus, confidence? Do you have a mindfulness or meditative practice that you used while you played? Yeah, well, Phil introduced meditation to us when he came um, to our team in 99, 2000. And um, it was something that I instantly gravitated to because I could see the effects. Right? You, when I used to watch, you know, studying the games, the Bulls teams, and um, you know, watching their demeanor, watching their composure, you know, playing in a tough place in like Utah doing the finals and being down 17. But everybody was like this. You couldn't tell if they were down 17 or up 20 or a tie game. It never changed. And I was wondering why the hell that is. And that's why I started doing more research. And when Phil came, I immediately gravitated to it and then found myself accepted the challenge of finding what that space is. And for the 81-point game, man, to be honest, I, was, I wasn't even thinking about the game. My knee was hurting so much. 
Um, I didn't know then, but you know, I had a flap of joint, uh, of cartilage stuck in my joint line. And so my mind was really trying to go to a place where I don't feel that pain. And uh, the game started, and because of that, I was just in a different space. You know, I wasn't worried about what was to come. I wasn't worried about what just happened. I was just here. And when you're just there in the moment, playing plays right in front of you, your focus is heightened because nothing else matters. Um, and uh, that's the space I've tried to get to. It's a perfect definition of mindfulness in the present moment without judgment. And, Not uh, for nutrition, though, because I did have a pepperoni pizza the night before the game. <laughs> and full disclosure, I also had a plain quarter pounder with cheese before the game. So... <laughs> <laughs> to be young. Uh, dinner of champions, exactly. Yeah, you would yeah. need that now. Yeah. Nutrition and, didn't come till later. So you, you talk about practice, and I want to I underscore that. Um, you know, Allen Iverson, who was a phenomenal player with the 76ers, famously ranted about, you know, when asked by a reporter about missing practice, and he just went, you know, practice, we're talking about practice. I mean, it's practice, <laughs> not a game. I mean, it was classic. He went on for yeah, minutes. Yeah. You know, the Iverson approach is not the Kobe Bryant approach. You, you really focused on practice. Tell us what you brought to practice and how you sort of made that standard for the rest of your team. Well, I mean, here, here's why practice was important to me. Not from the, just the standpoint that I enjoyed playing. Like, I enjoyed being there. Um, I enjoyed getting better. But as a leader of a team, it's also your responsibility to elevate the rest of the guys. And... What people tend to get stuck on a lot is saying, okay, the way to make players better is to pass them the ball when they're open. That's a very trivial way to look at things. What you have to do is you have to get them emotionally to want to be better. You, want, you, you have to get them to an emotional space where they wake up every morning driven to be the best version of themselves. Right? And how do you do that? And in practice, for me, it was a chance to, to drive them, to challenge them, right? If they're, and, and this is where you have to know your teammates. Because if it's late, you just had a back-to-back, -back and we had practice the next day, and you show up, and guys don't feel like going through the motions, don't feel like practicing, it's important to know each and every one of them individually, personally. Because then you know what nerve to touch. Some guys, it's like, okay, come on, let's, you know, we can do this. That'll get them going. Other guys, no. You got to figure out what button to push. You know, Powell was always Spain. If I tell them how they lost in a gold medal to us and how they're going to lose again, how I'm going to beat your ass in practice just like I beat you in a gold medal game, oh, that, oh he would hate that. <laughs> He'd hate that. But that's what practice was. You have to drive them. You absolutely have to. And if practice is more intense and harder than a game seven will be, then a game seven will be easy. But if it's not, then that's when teams start folding and capitulating. You know, you actually... It's a perfect segue to, uh, you know, how to create a high-performance culture with coaches and team leaders. You know, everybody's sort of got to be on that page of helping you become the best version of yourself. Speaking of that, we have someone who'd like to ask you a question from Seattle. Please roll this question. Hi, this is Pete Carroll from the Seahawks, uh, joining in uh, with uh, Professor Belasco's class and with one of the all-time greats, uh, Kobe Bryant. I'm thrilled to be part of this night. Uh, but I just have one simple question, really. Kobe, uh, you have been one of the all-time great competitors that have ever played in, in any sport. And I, I'm real curious to, to, to know uh, what it was like for you with all of the grit and all of the makeup that you had to be such a great competitor. What was it like for you to play with people that, that weren't as gritty as you were? How did you deal with that? Um, how, how did you set your expectations knowing that that you were so far out there, uh, and, and how did you deal with the players that you played with, you know, knowing that they, they were still kind of somewhere on the spectrum, but, uh, but you, were, you were on the top of it? Good question. It's a great question. Um, my response might sound a little um, tough, but I, I, I just, I'd kill them, I'd bury them. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's, you know, tolerance, for that and the, the kind of culture that the Laker organization stood for winning championships is not tolerated. You're going to show up to play and you're going to lollygag through this scrimmage, through this drill. I'm going to beat you 
I'm going to let you know I beat you. And I'm going to want you to reconsider your professional life choice. <laughs> you know, and, and, and for the most part, you know, people will say, okay, that doesn't make a great teammate. Well, I'm not here to be a great teammate. I'm here to help you win championships. So there's a difference. Um, and, you know, fortunately for us and for me, you know, we had an organization that, it was championships or nothing. And they were really good about identifying that and bringing players in here that had that competitive streak and you know, getting rid of the ones that did not. If I got to fight to get you in the gym, that's a problem. That's a problem. You want players that are gym rats, players that want to be in the gym, that want to work. And then from there, you build on top of that. But if you're lazy, man, I don't want to talk to you. I won't deal with you. You don't make me feel dumber. You know, <laughs> you know, you're going to lower my level. I don't think so. You can go over there. <laughs> There's plenty of teams in here where you'll fit right in. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned... At the time, they were right down the hall from us. <laughs> so, <laughs> <you> know, <laughs> yeah. They were. You, you mentioned the organization, and, and we're, we're talking about leadership, not just on the floor and the players. Within a basketball franchise, the players, you know, they're accountable to, we, to each other to the coach, the coach reports to the GM, the GM reports to ownership. Let's, let's look at leadership from both the players' perspective and the organization. So to help us with that, please welcome the president and the controlling owner of the Los Angeles Lakers, Jeannie Buss. It's so good to have. I made a call upstairs. I, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Thank USC you. campus. I when I heard that you were going to be here, I had to to stop by and welcome you and tell you thank you for inspiring another generation. Um, and uh, I, I'm sure everybody's enjoying having you here today. Thank you. Thank you. This is family, man. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of that, so can you you share? the relationship between Kobe and the Buss family with your dad and you, your brothers, um, and what he's meant to the, the franchise and your family. For us, um, you know, Kobe was drafted at 17, and I'll never forget meeting him. Um, he was a um, eager young man, and he, I, I, I'll never forget our waiter, we went to lunch, and our waiter, um, Kobe asked him if he spoke Spanish, and the waiter said, yes, I do, and Kobe said, I'm going to learn Spanish, and I, I thought that was so odd for somebody so young to, to give himself a challenge like that, and now you speak beautiful Spanish, Thank Italian, you. you do your press conferences in both languages, so, you know, the idea that we had um, a, a franchise player in this, in this young kid, um, was a gift for our family and um, you know the, the idea that you have been a Laker for 20 years throughout your entire career uh, that meant a lot to my father Dr. Buss that um, you were a Laker for life thank and you, you were. Thank you. You always got So what what changes, we're talking about leadership, and I want you both to sort of to answer this. What changes did you notice in Kobe from coming in at 18 to maturing and becoming sort of a leader, not just sort of Shaq and Kobe, but what, what changes did you notice over time in him? When you have a, a, your star player who is the first one at the gym and the last one to leave, it sets the bar for everybody else. He made my job so much easier because of his leadership. Um, I don't think people, he ever really gets the credit for the amount of work that he puts in because he made it look effortless. And, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, his teammates would get a little frustrated with you because you did set the bar so high. But that's, that's what made the Lakers great for your tenure as, as a Laker. And, we miss you. <laughs> <laughs> you 
You know, in most, in most, you know, as Kobe said, the Lakers play for world championships. They don't play for division championships or conference championships. They play to win it all. And from 1997, when Kobe came in the league through 2012, the, the Lakers were in the playoffs all but all but one year. Um, the last few years of Kobe's run, um, uh, they were a young team and they weren't in. They were out of playoff contention. How does your attitude and leadership deal with? changing goals you know I, I know it's it's good to say that you want to win the championship every yeah. year but it probably wasn't really a realistic one so how do you ad adjust how do you adjust as a team leader I, and then how uh, what conversations does ownership have with the coaches well, and I teams about rebuilding Jeannie Jeannie um, is so sweet that she saw me work so hard for so many years and the last few years um, her and Rob who was at the time my agent um call me and say, listen, we are so sorry for what happened to this team. We're sorry that we don't have, seriously, it's like we don't, we're sorry we don't have a team around you that can contend for a championship. I mean, you know, it's, it's um, so we can make a few calls and get you on a contending team uh, if that's something, because we just feel horrible about seeing you going out there and struggle, remember this? And, and I said, then I listened, I said, you know, we've known each other for a very long time. We, I'm, now I'm questioning myself because I'm wondering what about me makes you think I would jump ship. <laughs> we don't do that. Because you know, we don't do that. <laughs> we couldn't take losing and 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 how angry you would get. I know. <laughs> that, we that's were probably scared. what it is. We were scared. Yeah, I, I flipped a few tables. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> Maybe more than a few tables. It's like that Kobe yeah. face. <laughs> but, yeah. It's, it's, I felt bad for Mitch. If you, well, not really. A little when, bit. When, little bit. when we lost to the Celtics in uh, 2008, mm -hmm. um, you and, and Phil Jackson used to say it's worse to lose in the finals than to not make the playoffs at all. And losing, especially to the Celtics, was that much more difficult. But you just took that right from the court and went to the Olympics and led the team to a gold medal. So you just you took that, and then then you were on a mission to mm -hmm. get back into the finals and win, and and you did. And mm -hmm. like but we played, we, it's fan, but to me it's fan, like it's it's not like the Lakers. I've been a Laker fan since five years old. I mean, I can I know the Laker history all the way from Minneapolis all all the way to where it is today. All right, so it's in my blood, and, and this family, her father, um, um, believing in me and standing by me and all sorts of stuff. Like, I, I'm not, not going to go anywhere. Like, this is home to me. You know, we work through this stuff together. And, like, you know, as a leader, you got to be able to take the good with the bad, man. You can't just, because the ship's sinking, all of a sudden I'm going to jump off and swim to another ship. Like, that, you don't do that, right? If you can win championships in front of everybody, then you can – Miss the playoffs in front of everybody. You got to be able to take both sides of it. Or, or sign with Golden State. <laughs> well, but they, no, weren't, they weren't losing. That's a, no, it's a con. It's, it's, it's the opposite view. It's the yeah. opposite view. And no, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to stay. It is hard. And that's why in... in the Jersey retirement ceremony, I said, I talked about that. It might have been easier for you to leave. And, you know, you didn't. And that, you know. Yeah. If you're doing something that's so easy, man, you might want to reconsider what you're doing. Like, I, I don't, like, I can't. You know, Durant's been a friend of mine for a very, very long time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, you know, he's been a friend of mine for a long time. So has LeBron and all those guys. Would I make the same decision? No. But that's their decision. That's their choice. I would have stayed, but... It is what it is. Yeah, it, uh, people have to do what's right for them. You know, I mean, it, it's not a judgment. It's just a fact. So, <laughs> it is. It, it, it is. It is so, what it is. So, Jeannie, you, you mentioned the retirement ceremony. And it was unique, one, because it came very early. He'd only been retired for a year. Um, and, you know, as, as, as people know, Kobe switched numbers from 8 to 24 during his career. Why did you decide to retire two jerseys in both numbers? Well, it, 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 that was a kind of a, a, a debate that we had internally. And really, the, the whole idea of retiring a number 
for a, a player is that you know no one else can ever wear that number again because you will always think of the, the former player great in that number. And so we knew that no one was ever going to wear 8 or 24 for the Los Angeles Lakers ever again. But if you took the body of work of Kobe wearing number 8 and Kobe wearing number 24, both of those players would qualify to be on the wall. And he just happened to be one who, who had such an amazing career. He deserved to be up there twice. <laughs> I am so grateful that uh, that Jeannie was able to come here. I know you've got another a commitment that you have to go to. Would it, I'm, I'm going to say this off the record. Would you ever come back and talk about your businesses with our students at some point? <laughs> I, would, don't, I would love don't. to. <laughs> let's, let's thank Jeannie Buss for coming by. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Jeannie Buss. Uh, <laughs> you, you can see why Kobe, you know, some of these, you know, Kobe, uh, Jordan, phenomenal players, probably not coaches. <laughs> probably well, not. I do coach my daughter's team. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do. I do. I coach my, I coach my daughter's team. This, oh. She's uh, this is a sixth grade basketball team. We run a triangle offense. <laughs> we do. We do. And, and, and uh, you know, you can't tell kids to scorch the earth. I mean, they're too young for that, right? So you got to first <laughs> teach them how to scorch the earth, right? So you, you got to teach them fundamentally how to pass with your left hand, how to make left-handed layups, how to dribble appropriately, how to proper spacing, and, you know, all the basics first. And then when they get to 17, 18, then it's, you know, Dracarys. <laughs> All right, so let's just make a note for admissions. Seven years, let's put her on the radar and let's keep watching <laughs> her play. We've, we've got a couple more minutes and I'm going to have students ask you some questions, but I want to, uh, I want to dive into your businesses now that you're sort of transitioned from basketball. Um, it's interesting because most athletes and retired athletes focus their business efforts around building their own brand, their personal brand, and certainly, you know, you have a brand, you have a shoe, um, but you've chosen to do something else, something that's, that's more bold, something that you really haven't done before. Can you tell us why you're doing this, why you're going into a creative endeavor like Granity Studios? Um, because I love doing it. I mean, it's, it's that simple. You know, you have to sit and ask yourself what, what is truly going to get you up in the morning, what's going to keep you up at night. And, um, you know, when you find what that answer is, you stay true to that. You know, I've, I've built a brand for the last 20-some years, personal brand, which is great. But that is not where our focus is going to be for the next 50 years. Right? It's what we are doing now. Are we taking a big risk? Yeah. But I think that if we focus on one thing and do that one thing exceptionally well, we won't fail at that one thing. So sometimes you got to put the other stuff to bed and focus on what you believe is, is, uh, is the core of the company. And that always starts from what you love to do the most. So let's focus on, on Granity. Uh, Bryant Stiebel Partners is a, primarily a venture fund, invests in early stage and growth stage companies. Your partner, Jeff Stiebel, very experienced investor. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have, have had some wins already with some great companies. But I want to spend some time on Granity because I think that's sure. where most of your, your creativity is expressed. Um, we talked about setting limits and artificial limits and beliefs on ourselves. Granity Studios, what does the word Granity mean? Um, it means greater than infinity. And I just took those words and then made a new word. <laughs> um, and the, the whole idea is that, you know, when I started playing the game, everything was about trying to be the best. Win this many, you know, win as many championships as you can, yada, 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 yada. You get older, you start to understand that really it's about the next generation, that these championships do come and go, right? And, There'll be other people that win championships. But the most important thing you can do is to pay everything that you've learned forward to the, to the next generation to come. And that's truly how you create something that lasts forever. Right? And so the fundamental belief of the company is create forever. Now, how do you do that? And uh, that's how you create something that's greater than infinity. You inspire one who inspires the next, who inspires the next, and on and on you go. And uh, that's the foundation of it all. That's great. And Granity Studios sort of 
two different uh, areas, uh, content production and publishing, right? Can you tell us, uh, on the content side, tell us about detail with Kobe Bryant and uh, is it Puny Pete and Friends? Puny Pete and Friends. Tell us about those two things. Um, So, well, detail, we'll launch that um, April 12th on uh, ESPN+. And what I observed a lot of my career is how players study film. Because now it's become like you watch game film and you see what you do right, you see what you do wrong. Okay, let's do more of that, let's do less of that, right? But the way I grew up from Tex Winter, Phil Jackson, the way film was broken down, it was broken down to the smallest detail. It was broken down to the right angle. It was broken down to foot placement, timing, um, looking at the posture of a teammate. You know, what could he be thinking? What could he be feeling? Same thing with the opposition. You know, you watch the feed, watch players go into the timeouts, who's talking to who, who's not talking. You, you start looking at every little thing. And so watching the game for me would take like five hours. Um, and that attention to detail is what's missing. So I felt like if I can put that in a show and have the next generation, the, the 11-year-old kids, 12-year-old kids, start watching the game at that level, what are they going to be when they're 25? You know, what level would they be at then? Um, and uh, it's a passion of mine to get that thing going. Like I said, April 12th would be the first episode. It's so interesting, you know, we, we learn so many things when we're younger, and then we never really turn back to learn how to learn. And so this is a, a tool to learn how to learn and learn how to become great. Um, and then what about Puny Pete and Friends? Puny Pete is like, it's, it's, I decided to create like a sports version of the Peanut Gang, which is like the funniest thing. It's awesome. There's these little kids, this kid named Puny Pete, and God bless his heart. No matter how hard he tries, he can never seem to get shit right. Um, but he tries and tries and tries and tries, and, and it's a podcast. And what I wanted to do with a podcast is, you know, typically you hear a person talking, and then the podcast almost becomes white noise because you kind of hear somebody talking, and then you kind of do that. Did you pay attention? But what I wanted to do is take it back to, you know, where there was no TV and sports was telecast on the radio. So we have these two characters, Clark and Kimberly Spice, and they're the announcers. So they're our vision into the world. And so they want to grow up to be the greatest announcers ever. Right? And so they're commentating on what it is that we see. And you have these kids that are out there playing all of these sports, baseball, football, basketball. And it's really about the relationship between them all and about the power of dreams and success and failures. And it's, 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 it's a series about their journey, but it's, it's, uh, it's fun. And it's a podcast, right? Podcast, podcast. Yeah. And on the, on the um, publishing side, I've heard that you have like nine different novels yeah. uh, in, in development. Can you tell us what realm they're in? And what role do you play in, in generating the characters and the content? Um, it's YA, and uh, it's all sports and fantasy. So, you know, um, I, you know having kids, um, if I try to tell my daughters you have to work hard and all sort of stuff, like they just kind of look at me like, yeah, dad, yeah, we get it, we get it. And they just kind of go in one ear, go out the other. So I've had to start trying to figure out how to seed that into stories, into content, into short stories, right? Stories I can read to them at you know, bedtime. And then that's when the messages would sink in because they pay attention to a character more so than they would pay attention to what the hell I'm saying, you know? But I trick them because I wrote the story, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, <laughs> and so that's what this, where this whole idea kind of started. And from there, we, you know, I just started kind of outlining different characters and uh, creating an entire world that centered around sports and fantasy and magic. And uh, um, the first novel series that we'll release is called Rillaby Wizenard. And it's a, uh, it's a magical coach that comes in to teach these kids the magic that's within them and use fundamentals of the game and the emotion within each character um, and how they navigate those emotions to reach their full potential. Those are universal themes. It sounds like you're, you're sort of using the Disney model. You're building a studio in Orange County. Yeah. Getting Hollywood talent to come down there and join you. Well, we need we need great writers, um, editors. If there's anybody in here in this room that fits that there bill, you go. bill. <laughs> we're in Costa Mesa. So, <laughs> anybody that loves sports and loves story and loves fantasy, so it's got not, a home for you. You know, we just happen to have the number one cinema school in the world. <laughs> Probably the most storied athletic heritage in all of college sports. Great business school, great engineering. So I think there'll be plenty of people that will probably be joining you at Granity. Awesome. And I'd like to, before I turn it over to the students to ask questions, I, I, I really find it fascinating that you have, have, you know, sort of immersed yourself in something that is, you know, very different than professional sports. 
It hasn't really been done before. And that uh, I hope you feed your creative side through granity like you fed your competitive side through sports. Thank you. And I just wish you all the best. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Let's start off with some students. You can stand up, too. Stand up. Tell them who you are. Got about six or seven for you. <laughs> hey, Kobe. I mean, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Sarah Hughes. I'm a master's student in the entrepreneurship program. I played on the beach volleyball team as an undergrad, and now I play professionally for Team USA. Uh, my question for you is, what did you know and learn at the end of your career that you wish you knew at the beginning? Um, understanding empathy and compassion. Because right? as, as a young kid, when I came in the league, it was like, I'm driving this way, and either you're going to be on the train or be on the track. <laughs> right? Where there was no such thing as understanding that people have lives outside of the game, <laughs> which, which you know, I, apparently I did not. Um, but like if I understood that at an early age, and I, it, it helps me as a leader to communicate better. I came to understand that later um, and um, getting to know people on a personal level. Um, what are their fears? What are their insecurities? Right? What are their dreams and ambitions, desires, those sorts of things? When you come to understand that about a person, then you can help them reach the best version of themselves. So I wish I'd known that earlier. Thank you. No, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, Kobe, how you doing? What's happening? I'm Jordan McLaughlin. I'm a senior here working on my master's in communication management. Uh, I played on the USC basketball team here. Uh, my question for you is I'm preparing for the NBA draft right now. Mm -hmm. So, what recommend oh. you? Oh. Thank you. What recommendations do you have for someone on picking an agent? Um, don't, because it's a dying business. I hope there are no agents in here. It's probably, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Uh, you know, I, I, I was very fortunate because Rob was the kind of agent that um, worked in collaboration with his players. Right? So my advice to you is find an agent that's going to collaborate with you, not point you here, point you there. Right, or work behind the scenes in the shadows without you knowing what the hell's going on. Right? An agent that's going to have you be a part of the meetings, right? have you in that room, discuss with you, not just pop a contract in front of you, but actually walk you through clause by clause what it is that you're signing or getting into and, and get your feedback on it. Um, so um, if you can find an agent like that, man, you're, you're doing well, man. Cool. Appreciate yeah, it. You got it, man. Thank Good luck. You. Thank you. Good luck. My name's Waverly. I'm a senior majoring in international relations and global business. Um, <laughs> and I've really enjoyed um, hearing about your different projects and new businesses. And I was wondering if you've had to tone down your competitiveness and your approach in a new work environment. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, more than a little bit. Yeah. No, it, well, ba it, like I said, basketball is different because it's such a direct competition. Um, and what we do now, there isn't. The, mm -hmm. the competitiveness that I... Um, bring to work every day is really helping people, in a sense, be competitive with themselves, right? If you're, if you're animating something or, or um, you're writing a screenplay or you're composing a piece of music, is that the best you can do, right? Don't ask me, don't say, okay, do you approve? Don't ask me, I'm not the musician, I'm not the composer, you know, mm -hmm. right? So the competitiveness is more from an individual perspective. Are you, is this the best you can do? And uh, if the answer is yes, then off we go. So it's, it's different. Mm -hmm. It's different. Thank you so much. You got it. Very welcome. <laughs> Hi, Kobe. Hey. <laughs> My name is Victoria Yurek. I'm a junior <laughs> <laughs> broadcast journalism major. My daughter came to watch them play, by the way, volleyball. And she, we were sitting right there, and she was like, oh, my God, they hit that ball so hard. That was the first time watching you guys play, so. 
Thanks for coming. You're always welcome. Thank you. Um, my question for you is, players like Kevin Love and DeMar DeRozan are coming forward sharing their stories about mental health. What is your take on this, and why is it important that elite athletes join in on this universal conversation? Well, that's a great question. I, I think it's important for athletes to own what it is that they're going through. It's awareness, right? I think a lot of times we try to tell children, tell young athletes in particular, um, that if you have those thoughts and those feelings, that's weakness. That's bad. You shouldn't be feeling that which then causes them to right, feel some type of way about themselves. Right? And they carry that around with them for the rest of their lives. And I think the most important thing is for us to be aware of what's going on in here. Not that it's bad, good, or indifferent, but it's awareness. And once you're aware of it, then you can choose to walk hand in hand with it, or you can choose to fight it, but you're making that decision. If you just can constantly bury that in the distance, then it starts festering and it comes up in different ways and manifests itself in different ways. So I think it's unbelievable what Damar and what Kevin are doing um, and uh, hope to see more of it. Thank you. You got it, you got it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how hey. you doing? Fantastic. <laughs> I'm Satori, I'm a dance major here at USC. Um, I'll be the first graduating class and I'm a junior now. Uh, so, of course, I have to ask, uh, a lot of times dancers and athletes find themselves at odds with each other, um, mm -hmm. even though their crafts sort of demand the same thing from them. Sure. So I have to know, um, how do you see dance and other art forms and athletics in alignment with one another? Well, um, there, was a, there was a year we played um, Indiana Pacers in the finals. I rolled my ankle really bad. Mm -hmm. Jalen Rose stepped under me on purpose. Uh -huh. <laughs> He admits it now, finally. And rolled uh -huh. my ankle really, really bad. I came back, finished the series, um, but I couldn't touch a basketball until mid-September, which was driving me crazy because I couldn't train. Mm -hmm. But I looked at, this was like the 10th time I rolled my ankle in one season. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, okay, I gotta address that. And so be, being that I couldn't get on the basketball court, um, what I did was I took tap dancing lessons. <laughs> okay. No kidding. I took Absolutely. tap. And tap was like the best training for me in the world because it strengthened my feet. It changed my rhythm and my approach to the game. I was able to change speeds when I came back the following season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think dancers um, put way more strain on their body than athletes do. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from that. My daughter took ballet for several years. And I would sit there in the class, right? And I didn't know what I was getting into because I don't know anything about ballet, right? But I'm sitting there in the class and I'm watching her and I'm watching her get the first position, the second position. And I'm, start, I'm learning the structure and the rules that go along with that. Mm -hmm. And as athletes, there's a lot to be learned from that. Because if you simply go out there and perform and play, yeah, you'll be great every now and then. But if you play with structure, if you understand the rules that come along with that, the discipline that comes along with that, then you reach another level. But you guys have my respect. If other people that don't see that, they're idiots. That's on them. Thank you. <laughs> you got it. Thanks. <laughs> by the way, I was a horrible tap dancer, by the way. That Mambo mentality didn't translate to that shit, man. How's it going, Covey? Good, man. How you doing? Good. <laughs> so my name is Malik. Uh, I'm a senior studying communication. I'll be earning my master's in communication management I'm on the football team. So I was just wondering, um, what is the most important thing that I can take away from football that would translate into my life after sports? Well, I mean, it's different for everyone. You know, I, I think for me, it was um, um, the, the, the discipline, the teamwork. I mean, I think teamwork's the most important thing in the sense of, you know, sports is a place where you can have so many different ethnicities, people from, um, different religious beliefs, political beliefs, which are all grounded with one focus of achieving one thing, right? So being able to put those things to the side to accomplish a goal. And uh, that's one of the strongest lessons I think you should take from team sports. Thank you, appreciate you it, it, man. Good luck to you. Right, you. How you doing? I'm Captain Corbin Pierce. I'm a active duty reconnaissance Marine. All right. And also a father. So I have a last question. I have a family question for you. Off the court now, how do you inspire and foster that vision of greatness in a child? You talked a little bit about your, the stories you tell them. Um, a mentality that's very different than what they see every day in social media and so on. Um, you know, I try to get my kids to see the beauty in the process. 
Um, so when he got old enough, I used to take him with me to workouts. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, he used to be over there kicking a soccer ball around or whatever. But they would see. Right? It's not they sitting there and watching upset, but they would see. You know, they know I'd get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. Right? They know I'm training again. You know, and um, this film, Dear Basketball, I mean, they were there with me as I was writing it and uh, going through the animation process, going through step by step. And I think the important thing that we can do as parents is to lead by example, mm -hmm. but also encourage our children to think incrementally. Not to say, okay, I'm, I want to be like, you know, Gianna, for example, my daughter who plays basketball now. She said, Dad, can you teach me how to play basketball? I'm like, sure. She's like, okay, I want to be better than you. I'm like, all right, cool. You know, just, you know let's, let's, start, let's start with 15 minutes a day, right? And for 15 minutes a day, we just stood right in front of the hoop and just shot, right? Right under the hoop. We didn't move around. We didn't do any dribbling. Just 15 minutes a day, just shoot here, right? And you do that for a month and a half. And then next month, you step back. And next month, you step back again. And then you start working on dribbling, right? And so I think through actionable things is how we teach our children. Because right? we can sit there and tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them, we're not, you know, we're kidding, we didn't listen, right? But it, through sports, you can teach them how to think things incrementally because that's the way they behave. And if it becomes a part of their process in sports, it'll become a part of their process in life as well. Thank you. I'm it's an honor to hear you talk. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, amazing questions. Great questions. It, it, Imagining you training your daughter to play basketball, I sort of thought of uh, the Karate Kid and Mr. Miyagi. You know, just do this wax one all, thing. Just do this one <laughs> thing for a month. So for a month, his daughter's just shooting like three foot bunnies from That's the front of the rim. That's it. Um, you know, it's been a great time. I told you. We, and, and speaking of Corbin's last qu question about parenting and Mamba mentality, I want you to share why we promised to get you out of here and what you have to do today. What's your other obligation? Oh, because I don't like being second in carpool line. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but I'm really not. No, I, I, so, you know, my schedule is always the same. I get up super early, you know, I write, um, I work out, and I take the kids to school, and I go to the office, we work more. And then every day, I'm there in carpool to pick up my baby from school. And, um, and so I, 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 I don't miss that. I don't miss it. And uh, competitively, sometimes when I pull up and there's a car in front of me, I'm like, how the fuck? <laughs> How are you here before me? Like, I'm here yeah. 50 minutes before. Like, what the hell? God. Yeah. <laughs> could always could be, imagine, him, you know, cutting you off at carpool, just like you dodging in the last minute, cutting you off. <laughs> just always competing some way against yourself. No, it's just everything. annoying. It's just annoying. <laughs> well, at, at USC, we compete as well. We compete for the best students, the best entrepreneurs, the best dancers, the best athletes, the best engineers, the best guest speakers. We really try and bring everybody here. Right. You know, it's, it's sort of interesting because, because he went directly from high school to the pros, you, technically he has eligibility left. <laughs> he does. So, so I thought I would bring a, a great representative from USC uh, to help thank you. Please welcome the head football coach, Clay Helton. Clay. You would be the prettiest white out on the face of the planet. I know that. <laughs> well, Kobe, thank you so much. Thank you for what you've done for the city of Los Angeles, for what you have done for this Trojan family today. Uh, I'm going to tell you, the greatest gift you can give somebody is your time, and you gave your time today into your mindset. I've always thought that you were one of the most fierce competitors in the history of any game. Today I now know <laughs> that you are the fiercest competitor. And you taught these young people that to be great, you have to welcome competition. It's something right. that is innate in That's all right. the great people, and no matter what field you're in. And we'd like to thank you from our Trojan family to you. And we'd like to make you an honorary Trojan. All right. <laughs> all right. All right. Look at that, man. Sweet. How about that? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate you being you, buddy. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Stay up here. Hey, yes. students who ask the questions, get up here for a quick picture. You, this will show off the guns nicely right here. <laughs> this will be nice. Students who ask the questions, right. come on up really quickly. Guys, thank you for coming today. It's been a great day at USC. It's great to be a Trojan. Have a great week. Fight on. Thank you. Thank you, Kobe.